Some of the most important points of historical, cultural and social significance are the product of creative work, whether that be fine art, sculpture, buildings or movies. But putting the finished work aside, as incredible as it often is, the first thing that always comes to mind, at least for me, is how was it made? What does the artist or designer studio look like? What was their process? How were these classic paintings or contemporary sculptures constructed? How do these shots from the latest June movie actually get made? Who designed these shapes and structures? we see in the set design, and what did their process look like? These are just a few examples of my interest in the creative process, and if you're new here, my name is Alex, I'm a professional illustrator, and I make videos going inside and behind the scenes of all kinds of creative work, so if you're interested in seeing these kinds of videos, definitely consider subscribing. But in today's video, we're going to explore four really interesting creative spaces that you probably never seen before. The first artist I want to share today is the well-known Chinese artist Ai Weiwei, a sculptorist, architect, photographer and contemporary artist. He's very well known for his large-scale installations, often comprised of huge collections of different items and objects from steel rods to buttons to chairs. And if you're familiar with him, you might know Sunflower Seeds, an installation in the Tate Modern in London comprised of a hundred million individually sculpted and painted sunflower seeds. I'd strongly recommend watching a video on this and seeing actually how they were created because it has really quite an incredible and heartwarming story behind it. Now, because Ai Weiwei creates such large pieces of work, he often requires these huge warehouses to either create or store the vast number of items and objects he uses for his installations. And what's interesting is that he's currently building a new studio in Portugal. This new studio is a replica of his old one in Shanghai, which was actually finished in 2011, but then immediately demolished by the Chinese government, officially because of planning regulations, but unofficially because of Ai's long-standing criticism of the government. Um, if you're familiar with him, you'll know what I'm talking about. Putting much of that political stuff aside, his new studio is such an incredible building and creative space. It has a square shape which is reminiscent of traditional Chinese architecture and it's built in the traditional way with no nails or glue. And just on a personal level, I've always been totally fascinated by Chinese architecture and building methods. You know, the precise and careful engineering of each piece of wood. It's always been a deep interest of mine. And so whilst I'm sure I will use this space to create some amazing collections in the future, this new building is an artistic piece in itself. And so being able to see this project in process, literally see the inner workings of the structure in these photos here, how everything fits together, the precise carving of each piece of wood, it's just super fascinating to me. As many of his works are, it's a testament to the reality of the amazing human creative process that I love talking about in these videos. And even I himself has commented on his love for process. I don't even look at the final product, he says. I don't care about that much. The process is sensuous. It has blood, but the final is just a corpse to me. As for his new studio, he's enjoying the process of making it more than the prospect of actually using it. He doesn't really know how long he'll stay in Portugal after it's finished. I don't worry so much, he says. I enjoy the moment. Now, I'm sure most people watching are familiar with Casey Neistat, the very popular New York-based YouTuber, but you may not be as familiar with his old employer and mentor, Tom Sachs, a contemporary artist, sculptor, and filmmaker. And what's interesting is that the instantly recognizable studio setup that we've all seen in Casey's videos, with all of the neatly organized tools and equipment, is probably very much inspired by Tom Sachs. And this will become obvious looking at Tom's studio and the way that he organizes and stores a lot of his equipment and tools, often attaching them to walls in very uniform layouts and having a lot of things labelled and efficiently categorised. And what's interesting is that this is actually a process called nulling or nulling, which was a term coined in 1987 by Andrew Cromlow as he was building furniture for Knoll, which is an American-based office furniture company. Cromlow would arrange all of his tools so that they were all visible and easily accessible and he called this nulling after the company he was working for. And this is very similar to the concept of retrievability that I've talked about in previous videos where you want all of your tools and equipment out in the open, easy to access and ready to use. Tom Sachs later worked in the same place as Andrew Cromlow and then adopted and applied this practice of nulling in his studio which he then passed on to Casey Neistat who also did the same. Tom even developed the phrase always be nulling which encompasses a set of guidelines for you know how tools and equipment should be laid out in the studio and you can see from many of the images of Tom's studio space everything is very organized and ready to use when needed. It's really a way of reducing friction during the creative process right so not having one tool in its place can significantly disrupt creative flow and in some cases actually stop a project from even being completed and I'm certainly speaking from experience. So 
whilst this form of organization looks fun and looks kind of cool, it's actually serving what I think is a really underappreciated role in the process of making and building things and setting up an effective and efficient studio space. I'm sure many of you have either heard of Cause, also known as Brian Donnelly, or have at least seen one of his sculptures or paintings at some point. He's a very, very popular contemporary artist and designer, and most recognised for his series of characters called The Companions, which are these Mickey Mouse inspired characters with sort of crossed eyes. He creates a lot of other great work, of course, but being such a popular and successful artist, as you might expect, I was intrigued to get a look inside a studio and understand his process and actually see what kind of space he has set up in order to produce these kinds of pieces. And as I kind of expected, similar to his very precisely and meticulously crafted works of art, his studio, situated in Williamsburg in Brooklyn, is also a perfectly crisp, white, carefully controlled environment. You know, there's barely a single drop of paint on the floor, all of his pre-mixed paints organized and laid out in trays right next to the canvases, many of which are actually custom made by Golden, the paint brand, which I didn't even know was a possibility until I saw these photos. It's a very minimal and simple space, and there isn't really anything but the canvas and the paints and a few other bits of equipment. The focus is entirely on the process of making his art, with what seems like a very intentional effort to reduce distractions or opportunities to procrastinate. As I mentioned in other videos, despite being basically just a white room, there's still something extremely fascinating to me about these kinds of spaces. Maybe because, you know, a, a white room like a blank canvas is almost pregnant with endless artistic and creative possibilities. I kind of love also that his studio isn't a huge, vast warehouse, even though he's often working on five, six, seven, maybe even more paintings at a time. You can even see the canvases mounted on the walls pretty close together, right? But of course, this is all very intentional because even though his canvases are large and he's often actually working with very small brushes, like you can see here, painting very straight, sharp edges, I'd imagine that actually having this smaller, more confined space is actually a lot more effective and efficient for the production of this particular style of art. Marilyn Minter is an incredible American painter, well known for her semi-photorealistic depictions of women and the female body. Her artwork has a sort of shimmering, glowing aesthetic, which is partly from the reference photos, which she composes and manipulates in Photoshop, but it's also a result of a particularly interesting painting process involving the use of outdoor enamel paints instead of oil or acrylic. She also, very unusually, paints on metal sheets instead of traditional linen canvas because the flexibility of the canvas would actually cause the enamel to crack. And the reason that she uses an enamel paints in her process is that it creates this sort of glowing translucency with one layer going through the other more so than it does with something like oil paint. Oil is more opaque, enamel is very translucent. When I was working with oil I only worked with primary colours. Enamel enabled me to do special things that I couldn't do with oil. I could get the skin tones with the shades of blues and greens, what your skin really looks like. What's also interesting of course is her studio space and setup and particularly the fact that at least for the larger pieces she employs a number of assistants to help her produce her work and it's particularly particularly interesting in this context because as you can see the assistants aren't just filling in solid blocks of colour like they might be for artists like James Jean or Cause or other artists but they're doing areas of the paintings that actually require a lot of painting skill and experience and expertise and it should be noted that they're not just copying a photo because the finished paintings actually have a much more painterly embellished aesthetic compared to the large printout reference photos which you can see next to the canvas in many of these photos. The studio is very reminiscent of Takashi Murakami's studio in Japan but on a smaller scale of course and maybe not quite as clean and organized, I think it's really important to recognize that Marilyn's studio output, similar to Takashi Murakami, is ultimately the product of many people's expertise, including Marilyn of course. But I do think that many creatives who are part of the behind the scenes process often get lost or forgotten. And so these videos are in part made to highlight those people and processes that are contributing to the finished pieces of art or creative work that usually get all of the attention. But with that said, thank you for watching. I hope you found something interesting, enjoyable or new that you didn't know before. If you did, definitely consider dropping this video a like and subscribe if you want to see more artistic and creative behind the scenes type videos. But until then, thanks for watching.